Welcome to Reflecting Light. This podcast is about feeling the world with light by exploring myth, ancient texts, scripture, great works of world literature, and the works of artists, past and present, for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And now, here is your host, Mandy Green. Hello, listeners. Welcome to Reflecting Light. I hope you're having a glorious spring moment, whatever time of day it is that you're listening to this, and that you're just taking in all of this beautiful rebirth and regrowth and this return to life after the very long winter. I just got back from a vacation with my family for the first time with everybody in a few years, and it was just glorious. And Hawaii is a magical place. And I wanted to share with you some of the beachy wisdom that I was thinking about and taking in as I was there. There's a lot of really beautiful things we can learn from the ocean, from the shore, from waves, from hikes, from waterfalls, all of it. I mean, when I retire, I need to be by a beach. The ocean heals me. There's something about sand and surf and waves. And I realize that that's different for everybody. And so whatever it is that you find healing and connecting and grounding and that awakens you back to who you really are and your life's purpose, I would encourage you to pursue that and to make time, carve out time and means to make sure you're you're touching ground with that. Some good friends and I were having a little text thread as I was in Hawaii and he was commenting that in his world it would be always skiing season and I would be required to wear a jacket. And then he asked the question, am I required to wear Daisy Dukes in my world? And I said, absolutely. <laughs> Daisy Dukes will be the dress code for my world whenever I create that because there's just something beautiful to me about minimal clothing and GP drives through rain-soaked wind and canyons and along the beaches. And I am still working on the white Jeep. We're going to get there. But whatever it is, I would encourage you to just take a minute, close your eyes. If you're driving, you can't do that. Pretend you're driving a Jeep, roll down the windows, take in all of the spring blossoms or whatever air it is, and just take a moment to be grateful for this beautiful thing called life. If anything, when I'm able to go to places like that, it helps me slow down It helps me reevaluate what I think is important. It helps me stop rushing and racing from one thing to the next and just being. I think we so easily lose our sense of being and then we get caught up in all the rush and our days and our lives pass by as if in a dream. And then we look back and I hope there's something of value in all of those days and weeks. So here are a few things that I learned from being in my happy place. The first mantra is one I always shared with my family way too many times a day. Nobody is stronger than the sun or the ocean. Now, in order to stay alive in this environment, there are two things that are important for us to be humble about, that no one's stronger than the sun. This is our first trip out. We have been enclosed all winter. Some have been on missions, so their bodies have been even more covered up. And so we went through so much sunscreen. And the sun is really what gives life to everything. But it's so important to see that there's a balance in that, to have the humility to know that you aren't the equivalent of the sun. And I think there's a great spiritual parallel here in the sense that we tend to become pretty cocky or arrogant and think we've got it all figured out and we know everything. And really, the more I know, the more I realize I'm just 
an infant, it's important that we prepare ourselves to be in, in the presence of the sun. It's important that we understand that we are so much less, not in a worthless sense, but in the sense of understanding the magnificence of the sun and the light and the life that it sheds. The other aspect of that is no one's stronger than the ocean. We were at Brenneke Beach and they had these pretty gnarly waves coming in that you would boogie board on. And it was packed. There were so many people and you're trying to not take anyone out. But even these small cross currents, every once in a while one would come (laughs) that would just take everybody out. And it's always so interesting to me as I watch people in the water that there's sometimes this person who thinks they're bigger than the ocean or stronger than the ocean and stronger than the waves. And the ocean will quite quickly show them that they're not. So there's a humility in being in that space. There's a humility and an awareness of always watching, of always being present, of always being awake. If you turn your back to the ocean, you all know what happens. A wave will just come and and grab you. But that's the beautiful thing about the ocean and about water is you look at that vast expanse that goes without stopping. Or if you look at some of the beautiful waterfalls or canyons I'm always touched at this feminine aspect of water. Now, one would say the sun represents this masculine aspect, this brilliant light, this thing that gives light and life to everything. The other aspect that everything needs to grow is water. And if you look at the ability of water to shape anything, it's really quite astounding, this patient, constant, flow that over time cuts rocks, cuts mountains, cuts canyons. And to me, that's a very maternal energy. It's a very feminine aspect that is constant, pretty constant, I would say, and is always there nourishing, feeding, strengthening, giving life to. But again, humility, my friends, as we come in the face of the true power of the ocean and the true power of the sun. We are nothing in the face of of these two forces that give life and shape to our world. And so I think that same humility is really crucial in approaching these spiritual subjects of what divine femininity and divine masculinity really look like and understanding that we have just the smallest amount of understanding and that as you grow, as you become more tan, as you become more adept in the water, you're able to go further. You're able to wear a smaller SBF or whatever it may be, be in the sun longer. All this requires a constant vigilance and a constant presence and a constant humility to be in the face of these two forces. That's one thing I thought a lot about. Another thing that came to my mind a lot was that change is the constant. We become very, very attached to our schedules, to our lives, to comfort, to things that are familiar. And yet, if you spend any time out on the ocean or in the water, you understand that change is the constant. There's no perfect prediction. There's no perfect formula for understanding it. We had the awesome opportunity to go deep sea fishing with my brother-in-law, Rich, and his wife, Whitney, and daughter. And my son, Indiana, joined my husband and I. We went deep sea fishing out in uh, the Pacific. Now, I didn't understand that you trolled the entire time. So trolling means that you've got about six huge lines pulling from the back of your ship and they're just trying to catch a fish, trying to get one of those fish to bite. But to troll, you have to be constantly in motion. Well, from the time of day we went, that was a pretty bumpy ocean, first of all. 
Poor Indiana lost his sauce. It was interesting as I talked to the fishermen who take people out every single day, two or three times a day, and take them fishing. And I was talking to one of the fishermen, and he said, I've tried studying barometric pressure. I've tried looking at waves, tides, moon cycles, seasons of the year. I mean, he looked at so many different ways as a way to predict when and how they found the big fish that they found. He personally had caught a 1,400 pound tuna at one point in his career out there, which is pretty impressive. That's a lot of delicious seared tuna, but I digress. I did make my first seared tuna and it was amazing. If you need the recipe, I'll give it to you. You just rub your little cube down in sesame oil, put a lot of black pepper on it and then sear all the sides. And then here's the trick. You wrap it in tin foil, put it back in the freezer for like 20 minutes so that when you cut it, the seared part doesn't flake off. Something else you can learn from the fishermen when you start talking seared tuna. However, it was interesting to me that someone who had spent his entire life, 40 something years out fishing those exact waters and looking at all the different ways that he could study the waters that it was still unpredictable, that he still could not perfectly trace or perfectly account for when a fish would bite or it wouldn't bite, and what changed in the world to make the fish want to bite. And that was such a beautiful truth for me. I think we always want to think in very linear terms, A plus B equals C, or have these equations where everything works out, or if I put this in, I get this result. The ocean would teach us otherwise. And I think heaven would also be shown in that same pattern. Change is the constant, and that we can't predict everything. We can't account for everything. We can't know exactly the beginning from the end, and when the ups will happen and when the downs will happen. And I think that's important to remember as we go into spring and summer. Maybe it's a great time for us to just let go just a little bit more. All of us have these patterns in our life, right? We have these seasons and times, but sometimes we get too married to a result or an outcome. I was reading a book out there called Warrior Goddess Training. I want to share this small passage with you. This is from uh, Warrior Goddess Training by Heather, Heather Rash Amara, page 16. It's called Cyclical Living. Life flows within and around us, connecting us with all of nature. Life is the creative force of the divine. Its source is unlimited potential. So within the form of all things, from a rock to a flower to our bones, dwells pure potential and undivided from the source. When we align with life, we choose to align with all of life, not just the parts we like or are comfortable with, and not just when everything goes our way. Aligning with life means truly knowing and accepting the aging, death, sickness, natural disasters, accidents, humans, and their wacky ways. All these things are bound to alter our course. Aligning with life means understanding that you cannot control the cycles of nature. We cause our own suffering not because life is so big and unpredictable, but because we are attached to our desires and expectations. Cyclical living teaches us to embrace the ups and downs of life. Through tapping the truth, we learn to go beneath our own preferences and dreams to understand the natural cycles of the rising and falling away of all things. And she continues to talk about how nature would show us that there's cyclical living and linear living. Our linear living is, you know, very formulaic, but the cyclical living is allowing for the ebbs and flows. Sometimes the tide is in. Sometimes the tide is out. Sometimes the waves are very, very choppy. Sometimes the waters are calm. And it's important to remember that life has this type of cycle as well. And to not be weighing it all the time. 
it's really hard for me not to have expectations. And it's true. When I read that, I thought, you know, the times when I've really been crushed or hurt is when I had a certain expectation and it wasn't fulfilled or it didn't come true. And so just allowing, there's a beautiful grace in that if you think about the churning of the ocean, what it gives and takes. Anna Quinlan said, the thing that is really hard and really amazing is giving up on the being perfect and beginning the work of becoming yourself. Just allowing for that shaping and that molding to happen. Now, another book that I'm going to put in the show notes that I super recommend to everyone is called Gift from the Sea. It's by Anne Marl Lindbergh. She's actually the wife of Charles Lindbergh. She was always known as the wife of Charles Lindbergh, but she in her own right was an amazing writer and an amazing pilot. She she was the first woman in America to earn a first class glider pilot's license in 1930 the first woman ever to win the National Geographic Society's Hubbard Medal. And she also received the National Book Award in 1938. She raised six kids, I believe. When she was 65, she was still walking the Swiss Alps. And at 75, was down in the Haleakala Crater in Maui. And just a woman of tremendous scope and beauty and depth. And I recommend every person read this book called Gift from the Sea. When I went to Israel in 2014, I came back and I remember I felt reborn. I felt renewed. I felt like a new person. And yet everyone around me was very, how would I say this? didn't like the new me or was thrown off by the new me and wanted me to go back to the old me. And I just would look and think, there is no going back. You you can't go back from an experience like that, which caused me in turn to feel really broken and really fractured. I felt a lot of dissonance because I felt the most full and the most alive and the most truly myself I had ever felt. And yet those closest to me were very uncomfortable with that shift and it caused a big shift in our in our whole family dynamic. And it was during this time that I found this book. And there is such power in the written word. That's why I always talk about books as Thomas Jefferson said, I cannot live without books. Because her voice across all of those decades spoke right to my soul. And she talked about the gifts that the sea gave to her through each of these different stages of life and the grace that she learned from each of these different shells and from each of these different stages. If you find yourself feeling that dissonance or feeling any of that change or I feel good but my family doesn't love it, whatever it is. I really, really recommend this book. It's a beautiful, beautiful read. So highly recommend. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but let me read to you some of her beautiful words. This is from the introduction on page nine. The beach is not the place to work, to read, write, or think. I should have remembered that from other years. Too warm, too damp, too soft for any real mental discipline or sharp flights of spirit. One never learns. Hopefully one carries down the faded straw bag, lumpy with books, clean paper, long overdue answered letters, freshly sharpened pencils, lists, and good intentions. The books remain unread. The pencils break their points, and the pads rest smooth and unblemished as the cloudless sky. No reading. No writing, no thoughts even, at least not at first. At first, the tired body takes over completely. Is on shipboard, one descends into a deck chair apathy. One is forced against one's mind, against all tidy resolutions, back into the primeval rhythms of the seashore. Rollers on the beach, wind in the pines, the slow flapping of herons across sand dunes, 
drown out the hectic rhythms of city and suburb, timetables and schedules. One falls under their spell, relaxes, stretches out prone. One becomes, in fact, like the element on which one lies, flattened by the sea, bare, open, empty as the beach, erased by today's tides of all yesterday's scribblings. And then, some morning in the second week, the mind wakes, comes to life again, not in a city sense, no, but beach-wise. It begins to drift, to play, to turn over in gentle, careless rolls like those lazy waves on the beach. One never knows what chance treasures these easy, unconscious rollers may toss up on the smooth white sand of the conscious mind. What perfectly rounded stone, what rare shell from the ocean floor, perhaps a channeled whelk, a moon shell, or even an argonaut. But it must not be sought for, or, heaven forbid, dug for. No, no dredging of the sea bottom here. That would defeat one's purpose. The sea does not reward those who are too anxious too greedy, or too impatient. To dig for treasure shows not only impatience and greed, but lack of faith. Patience, patience, patience is what the sea teaches. Patience and faith. One should lie empty, open, choiceless as a beach, waiting for a gift from the sea. I think my very last day is when I felt that release, when I felt that disconnect, when my body really did finally and truly breathe and let go and relax on that seashore and become one with it, become empty, become open. Ironically, it was that day that we saw the most amazing things and sea turtles swimming with us. The end of her book, she continues to talk about how the sea will select for you what you need and how you need to be patient and have faith in that process. She continues on on page 111, in so many ways, this island selects for me better than I do for myself. When I go back, will I be submerged again not only by centrifugal activities, but by too many centripetal ones, not only by distractions, but by too many opportunities, not only by dull people, but by too many interesting ones. The multiplicity of the world will crowd in on me again with its false sense of values, values weighed in quantity, not quality, in speed, not stillness, in noise, not silence, in words, not in thoughts, in acquisitiveness, not beauty. How shall I resist the onslaught? For the natural selectivity of the island, I will have to substitute a conscious selectivity based on another sense of values, a sense of values I've become more aware of here. Island precepts, I might call them, if I could define them signpost toward another way of living, simplicity of living as much as possible to retain a true awareness of life, balance of physical, intellectual, and spiritual life, work without pressure, space for significance and beauty, time for solitude and sharing, closeness to nature to strengthen understanding and faith in the intermittency of life, life of the spirit, creative life, and the life of human relationships. Well, I don't think you can say it any better than that. Island eyes, island time, island values, stopping, pausing, taking a minute, learning to let go, learning to be part of this cycle. Albert Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift 
and the rational mind a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant, but has forgotten the gift. In his book, Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah, Richard Bach said, The river delights to lift us free, if only we dare let go. Our true work is this voyage, this adventure. The mark of your ignorance is the depth of your belief in injustice and tragedy. What the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls a butterfly. The last thing I wanted to say is that sunsets and sunrises are free to everyone. In ancient Egypt, the sunset and the sunrise were tremendous symbols of rebirth and death. Birth and death over and over again. That pinkish red hue that comes out when there's clouds really is part of that symbol. And as a new day is born, it is a new day. It isn't clean slate. It is another chance for you to wake and open with new eyes and patience and faith the gift that life will send you. So often we're so looking forward to something else that we fail to see what's right in front of us, what heaven is trying to give us, because we have it already prepackaged in our minds a certain way. Take time to enjoy beauty. And also take time to celebrate the births and the deaths in your life. Some days, watching that sunset is one of the most wonderful things in the world to me as I allow it to set on a day that was particularly tough or particularly hard or a season that was particularly tough or particularly hard. And there are other new beginnings that are full of promise and light and life and new scope. And celebrate those new beginnings as well. Those sunsets, as I watched one beautiful sunset on a beach, it was free for everybody. Anyone standing there had the ability to stop and enjoy that moment. That's what the island teaches me. To stop, to pause to let go of all of this busyness, to let go of my expectations, and to be more at one with this pattern, with this divine flow, trusting, truly trusting and knowing, my friends, that the gifts that heaven has will be sent to you. They'll be the shell that washes up to your feet or that you spot on the shore and take to your heart. And those gifts are divine and they are precious. To quote Mrs. Lindbergh, maybe the fewness of them is what's the most beautiful part of them, that we don't celebrate in quantity always, but these rare, beautiful moments, these really rare, beautiful gifts that come with that patience and that flow are really the most exquisite parts of our life in their beauty or their... There was a movie several years ago that reminded us not to forget the collateral beauty, even in our most sad, horrible things. And I'm not discounting that at all, part of that cyclicalness, but noticing that in those sunsets of our life that are particularly hard, it's during the night usually that that ocean will wash up that perfect shell on the shore that we find as we're reborn in the morning. Well, that is the podcast for today, my friends. May you put on some ocean waves, put on your Daisy Dukes or your Speedos or whatever it is that uh, makes you feel happy and alive. Feel the wind on your face, smell the amazing smells in the air, and just take a moment to stop and be. Wishing you love and light. Thank you for joining us for Reflecting Light with Mandy Green. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a good rating and share it with your friends. 
And remember, your light makes the world a brighter place. Share it.